Thank you. Thank you. I've always been taught that Sunday is the day the Lord made for us to rejoice and be glad. And on this particular Sunday, if anyone has reason to rejoice and be glad, it's the Jim Bunning family. Thank you all for being here. This is a great crowd. Thanks for sharing this day with me, making it so special. Baseball is a fantastic game. Ladies and gentlemen, I spent 22 years as an active player in professional baseball. That's a very large portion of my life. And my family's life also. And that part of my life comes to a very, very gratifying ending today with my induction into baseball's Hall of Fame. It's been a long wait. I'm extremely grateful that it's over. But this is one fantastic ending. First off, I would like to congratulate my fellow inductees. Bill Foster and Ned Hanlon were before my time, but they were part of the great baseball tradition. And I know their families are thrilled and they have finally been recognized this way. They deserve it. Congratulations, Earl Weaver. I never played against an Earl Weaver team. I had already moved to the National League when he started managing for Baltimore. But you gotta love the Earl of Baltimore. <laughs> Earl was a stand-up guy. He fought for his players, and you have to respect that. I'm proud to stand on the same stage with Earl Weaver and to join him as a member of the class of 1996. Congratulations, Earl. <laughs> Baseball is a team sport, and I didn't get here by myself. It took a lot of help. And one thing that baseball taught me is that life is a team sport, too. And I had a lot of help in both areas. In fact, I owe so many people so many thanks for making this day possible that it's hard to know where to begin. I know I'll forget somebody, but that's inevitable. After all, I started professional baseball in 1950, 46 years ago. And time has a way of dimming one's memory. So with apologies to those I do forget, I will begin at the beginning. My mother and father are the first on my thank you list. I thank them for their loving care and guidance, for always being there when I needed them, and for their keen and constant interest in my career. My biggest regret is they can't be here to share this day with me, but I know they're watching from somewhere up above us. And I know they're cheering today. Just like they did in Richmond, Indiana in 1950. Next is my older brother, Lou, who always made sure that there was a place on the team, even though I was five years his junior. Unfortunately, he's on that pink cloud up there, too, watching today's introduction. Thank you, Lou. Thanks also to my little brother, Bob. He was never quite sure what his middle brother was up to, but he also supported me in every aspect of my career. Thank you, Bob. And of course, I owe a very, very special thanks to my wife, Mary, the mother of our nine children, my childhood sweetheart from the fourth grade. We lived through good times and not so good times. 
Mary was my rock. And she prayed me to more wins than I ever thought I was capable of winning in the minor leagues, in the major leagues, and in life. She was my best fan and my best friend, and she's put up with an awful lot. How many road trips? How many nights and days of separation? How many birthdays missed? How many graduations? When I wasn't there, I was on the road. She put up with that and more. A popular commercial says, this one's for you. And as I'm, as I'm standing here today, Mary, this one's for you. And then there's my nine children, five daughters and four sons, all adults now. Barb, Jim, Joan, Kath, Bill, Bridget, Mark, Amy, and David. Kids, I thank you for the understanding all the times I missed something you thought was important. A dance, a first date, a football, basketball, baseball game, a birthday, a prom, your first driving lesson, or even your graduation. Mom was always there, but I missed a lot of those special days. I hope you know I loved you then, and I hope you know I love you now. And I definitely love the 28 beautiful grandchildren you've given me. That's right, folks, 28, with two more on the way very shortly. But don't worry, I'm not going to try to name them here all today. <laughs> These days, because of my new job in the U.S. Congress, I'm missing some of the important days for my grandkids. But I want you to know that I'm very proud of the Bunning family. You are my personal Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons I'm here today is that I had a great family behind me all the way. Well, please, Mary and all the Bunning family, all of them, please stand up. There are a lot of other people I need to thank. I thank these fellows behind me for coming here to welcome me to the Hall of Fame. You guys are great. Of course, looking at some of these fellows back here with their bald heads and bad sport coats, <laughs> it's a little hard to remember that baseball is a kid's game. Some of us got to be kids a little longer than others, but baseball is all about kids. And I'm glad to see so many of them here today. These fellows back here might be the greats of baseball, and they are. But the real heroes of baseball are the parents, and the teachers, and the coaches, and the volunteers who teach our young people to play the game and to love the game of baseball. And I had a lot, of help, a lot of help from a lot of heroes. People like Father Dye and Father Haney, who coached and sponsored my first organized team at St. Tree School in Southgate, Kentucky. Those were the good old days. George Krebs, my first catcher at St. Therese, is here today. And he still has a swollen hand from the unpadded catcher's mitt he used back then. Red Weekman, my second baseman from those teams at St. Therese, is also here today. Thanks, Red. <laughs> Thanks to all the other heroes, like the managers and coaches of my early knothole teams at the Bellevue Vets Knothole Field in Bellevue, Kentucky. I thank Bob Davis and Bonnie Washer for their help and guidance they were my coaches at St. Xavier High School in Cincinnati, and they taught me the fundamentals. Thanks to Ed Neltner, Bob Zimmerman, Joe Heakin, Nolan Cruz, Bud Connors, Red Brown, my coaches and managers in the Holy Name League and Buckeye Leagues, and everyone else who helped with those teams. These folks took a skinny little guy 
and taught him to love the game and how to play it. I also have to thank you, Xavier University, for the education you gave me. And thank you, Coach Ned Walk, and your, for your help and guidance that you gave me as a coach and as a man. Ned went on to be the Arizona State basketball coach for 25 years before he did. He convinced me to give baseball a try as a career. Thanks to the scouts, Kurt Hammerbeck, Wish Egan, Bruce Knatzer, and farm director, John Joseph McHale, for getting me signed professionally. I thank all my minor league managers. Between them, they made me into a major leaguer, and it took a long time. If Ralph DeLillo at Richmond, Indiana, hadn't given me the ball and said pitch, I never would have got started. Sparky Olson at Davenport, Iowa in 1951 gave me the opportunity to show what I could do. Paul Campbell, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, later at Little Rock, built my confidence. Bill Norman turned me into a winner for the first time in 1954. Jack Tide, Charlie Metro, Frank Scaff, Dan Carnavelli, they all believed that I could be a major league pitcher at a time when I doubted it myself. That kind of confidence eventually rubs off on you. When I got to the major leagues with the Detroit Tigers, folks like Bucky Harris, Bill Norman, Jimmy Dykes, Joe Gordon, Bob Cheffing took over. I learned something from each and every one of them. In 1957, Jack Ty believed in me enough to give me 30 starts and allowed me to establish myself in the major leagues. In 1964, I was traded to the Philadelphia Phillies and Gene Mock. Gene knew baseball better than anyone I had ever met. He was always two plays ahead of his opponent. More importantly, he gave, had enough faith in me to give me 160 starts in four years. And I managed to win 74 of them. Thanks, Gene, for your confidence in me, and thanks for those great years. There was Larry Shepard with Pittsburgh, Walter Alston with the Dodgers, back to Philadelphia in 1970-71 with Frank Lucchese. I want to thank all of those people for their help. And I want to thank the coaches, particularly the pitching coaches, who taught me so much and fine-tuned my skills. Guys from Schoolboy Row to Ray Ripplemeyer. I owe a lot to the trainers who kept me ready to pitch. Jack Hummel, Joe Lissio, Tony Bartarone, Bill Beeler, and my last trainer in Philadelphia, Don Seeger. I also have to thank the owners who had enough faith in me to give me a chance to play and prove myself. The Tiger owners, Walter O. Briggs, Spike Briggs, John Fetzer, Bob and Ruley Carpenter, who owned the Phillies, John and Danny Galbraith, who owned the Pirates, Walter and Peter O'Malley, who owned the Dodgers, Thanks for giving me a chance. And of course, I have to thank all the teammates I met and worked a long way with. No player, no player, not even a pitcher, no matter how good they think they are, can win a single game by themselves. I wouldn't be here at Cooperstown if it weren't for my former teammates. I'm sure that most everybody in the audience has been on a team of some kind and has experienced the feeling of camaraderie, that special closeness that can only come from teamwork, from being part of a team. If you have never experienced that feeling, it would be impossible for you to understand the warm feelings I have for my old teammates with whom I shared my 22 years in baseball. When I go into the Hall of Fame today, a little bit of each one of them goes with me. 
When I talk about my teammates, I'm talking about guys like my old roommates. Joe Coleman Sr., Frank Bowling, Rocky Calavito, Gus Triandos, Art Mahaffey, Ray Culp, Johnny Callison, Terry Harmon. They put up with me off the field and backed me up on the field. When I think back, I remember each teammate for something different. Some of them are fellows who fans might not recognize or remember, like Ned Garver, a pitcher with the Tigers when I got there. He helped convince me that I belonged. Or guys like Earl Torgensen, who got three hits, including a home run, to help me win my first major league game. Or Tony Taylor, who made a diving stop on Father's Day. that kept my perfect game alive. Some of them are players that everybody remembers, like Al Kaline. But I probably remember him for something different than the rest of you. I remember Al for knocking in two runs to help me win my first All-Star game appearance in 1957 in St. Louis, Missouri. But whether you were a superstar or not, those old teammates made it all possible. And I want to thank each and every one of them. To them, I say, wherever you are today, a little bit of each and every one of you is going into the Hall of Fame with me today. I would also like to briefly thank the members of the Veterans Committee. Pee Wee Reese, my fellow Kentuckian and fellow Hall of Famer. Ted Williams, the greatest hitter that I ever pitched against. Stan the Man Musial, Yogi Berra, the guy who gave me the one joke I keep using in Congress. <laughs> Bill White, my former teammate, and Monty Irvin. All fellow players, thank you. It means a very, very great deal to have your peers vote for you. Thank also to the representatives of the club executives, Joel Brown, Buzzy Bavese, Buck O'Neill, Hank Peters, and the media representatives, Bob Borg, Ken Coleman, Leonard Coppett, Ed Manzel, and Alan Lewis. Alan Lewis in particularly gets a special thanks. Alan covered the Phillies for the Enquirer when I was there. He believed that I belonged in the Hall of Fame, and he carried my cause to the Veterans Committee very successfully. Many thanks, Alan, for believing in me. I would also like to give a special thanks to Frank Dolson, the retired sports editor of the Philadelphia Enquirer. After my first year of eligibility for the Hall of Fame balloting, by the Writers of America, sports, the Baseball Writers of America, I wanted to withdraw my name from further consideration. And Frank Dolson talked me out of it. You were right, Frank. It's been worth the wait. Speaking of sports writers, I would like to add just one little short note to the current Baseball Writers of America. Do you have any clue how hard it is to win 300 games in the major leagues? Don Sutton did it with 324. Phil Negro did it with 318. There are among 20 people in baseball history who have done this. Quit messing around and vote them in the Hall of Fame as soon as possible. The stain goes for Tony Perez, 18th, 18th in the history of baseball on the all-time RBI list. He deserves to be there. Finally, the biggest thanks of all has to go to the fans. You Detroit Tiger fans out there, you were great. You Philly fans, 
Those were the greatest years of my life. God bless you. And all of the baseball fans, wherever you are, throughout North America, Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic, all the places that I pitched or performed, without you, this great game of baseball would be meaningless. Only because of you has baseball been woven into our national fabric. On a little more serious note, to the fans today, I would like to say, you made baseball our national sport. Please don't give up on it now. To the owners, I would like to say, get your house in order. Figure out how you want to share your revenue without going to the players and asking them to foot the bill. Get an agreement with the players, a long-term agreement, a minimum of 10 years. To the owners and players alike, I would say, get a commissioner, a real commissioner. Come up with a way to mutually share the cost of the commissioner's office and mutually hire, if necessary, through a third party, a real commissioner with restored powers of the commissioner's office prior to 1950. To the players, I would say, realize your obligations as professional athletes and look beyond your contractual obligations and accept the fact that you also have an obligation and duty to the game of baseball and to yourselves as human beings to conduct yourselves as gentlemen at all times and in the best interest of the game. Not one person, no person, is bigger than the game itself. Remember that the fans are the reason you are being paid the salaries you make. Treat them with dignity and respect. Always remember that without the fans, both the owners and the players are without franchise of any kind. If no one comes to the park or listens to the game on radio or television, both the owners and players are in deep trouble and professional baseball will end as we know it. Please, please don't let this happen to this greatest game ever invented. For over four years now, baseball has been rudderless. For God's sake and for the game's sake, find a rudder. Pick a course and stick with it and get your internal problems resolved before the Congress of the United States gives up on you and intervenes. The only thing that could be worse is if the fans give up on you. Baseball is still the greatest game in the world. It's not like the other sports. It's not like football, for the purpose of the game seems to be to knock other people around onto the ground. It's not like basketball. The purpose of the game seems to stand around the basket and knock other people to the ground. Baseball is much more sophisticated than that. Back when I played, people might chase a pitcher now and then and try to knock him to the ground. And of course, there's Albert Bell today. But for the most part, it's a non-contact sport. It's not a matter of shoving bodies around. It's a matter of being prepared for anything to happen. And when it happens, to react immediately to instantly analyze the options and to do what is necessary to get the job done. And you have to do it all in the blink of an eye or at the crack of a bat. Ask Michael Jordan how tough it is to play baseball.
And to those folks out there, I would say this. If you don't, know, if you don't want to make baseball your life, baseball can help prepare you for life. I know it's a little long, guys, but just be up. Relax. I'm almost done. After baseball, I was a stockbroker, and I represented players. And now I'm a congressman. And I have found that my life in baseball prepared me well for what I'm doing now. Over the years, I developed the skills I needed in baseball with the help of all the people I mentioned. I also developed a lot of other things. I developed a thick skin. If you've ever been booed by 40,000 people at one time, you know what I mean. Baseball helped develop my self-confidence. I also developed a respect for teamwork, self-control, and particularly competition. Those attributes have served me well in my current life. I have learned that the House of Representatives is as competitive as any baseball diamond. The competition is one of ideas and policies and opinions rather than runs and hits and strikeouts. But the competition is just as fierce as any pennant race. And I have discovered that the people who succeed in this battle are the ones who have the most developed sense of competition and teamwork. And that is what baseball provided me more than anything else. And I learned one other thing in baseball. I learned that if you set your goals high, keep trying, work hard, never give up, you can do anything you set your mind to. I played my first game at a family picnic, or a school picnic in the second grade. I decided I wanted to be a professional baseball player right then. I wasn't born with an overabundance of talent. There were a lot of natural athletes, baseball players, that had more talent. But I overcame those shortcomings with work and perseverance. I stuck to my goals. And that, in my mind, is what these people are all about and what the Hall of Fame is all about. It is proof that these men behind me, and they are living proof, that if you set your goals high enough, stick to them and work hard enough, you can do anything you want to do and you can be anything you want to be. And no matter what you want to be, play a little baseball along the way. It sure won't hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You've made this the best day of my life.